The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We're uh, uh, in the analysis of verse 2. So it'll be around page 3 of your notes. God the Father, the author of the plan, desires those that worship him to worship in spirit and in truth. God the Holy Spirit is the spirit who leads us into truth. Truth is the content of the revealed word of God, which we have dedicated ourselves to the study of book by book, verse by verse, doctrine by doctrine. So let's take the usual time to recognize that your responsibility, aside from being here, is to be here in stay in fellowship and focus your attention on the information that uh, we will be covering today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before the throne of your grace thanking you for the opportunity to continue to assemble ourselves together, to have the wherewithal to do so, even in the midst of various testing. Thank you for this opportunity and bless this information communicated to our edification and orientation to your perfect plan. In Christ's name, amen. All right, living the Christian life, our relationship to God. We'll reread the verses based on the preceding, directed at church age saints, believers of the current dispensation that has been made possible by failure, the failure of the Jews. Their colossal failure has opened the door for the opportunity for us Gentiles through the dispensation to step up and to participate in the plan of God at a very high level in a very uh, unique set of circumstances as we live in the era of the royal priesthood, uh, the universal uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and uh, other factors that uh, make this a very special uh, dispensation. Things to focus your attention on from time to time and encourage you that you are royalty, royal family, and this is our royal food, spiritual food that we take in uh, the word of God. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, always remember that we are under the mercies of God. These remain unchanged. All of his grace is there for us each and every day in every circumstance. It never fails. God is there to forgive, to provide the believer uh, who is serious about his plan to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Uh, we are alive still, we're in the world, and to be a holy sacrifice acceptable to God, then at any time you present yourself, present yourself as moment by moment living the Christian life. It isn't some special event, it is moment by moment under all the kind of circumstances that we encounter as believers living the Christian way of life. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're engaged in that is legit, then you are to be in fellowship and you are presenting your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. It doesn't have to be something, quote, spectacular. It's just everyday routine, various things that you do. You are presenting yourself to God as an acceptable sacrifice, holy and a, a holy sacrifice uh, before him, which is your reasonable service. My corrected translation on that. Wasn't real fond of the other one. 
because it, it seems to limit it to uh, worship, formal worship. It, it is not limited to that by any means. Obviously includes that. And therefore, it is sent an essential adjunct to acceptable service. This is a challenge. This is something that doesn't happen overnight. You gain further insight into what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate in your relationship to the world or the present time in which we find ourselves. And do not be conformed to this world order. Whatever its overt manifestation is at any time in history, I mean, yes, things remain the same, people act the same, but it is in a different, on a different stage, if you will, a different set of circumstances. Uh, we are not to be conformed to the world. This, this is not a call for asceticism or, or unnecessarily giving up things that are enjoyable, but it is to have everything under uh, an understanding that we are not to be like the cosmos and to think and to have their priorities uh, in, our, in our lives. If you, if you ever hear of these people talk about everyday things, uh, it has nothing to do with God and his plan often. Nothing whatsoever. They are caught up in the things of the world, the activities, the material things, this and that, and that's, that's the conformity factor that we are told not to be conformed to the cosmic system, but be transformed. This transformation, <coughs> this uh, metamorphomai, mouthful, means to be transformed. And how is this? By the renewal of your thinking or mind, the renewal factor, where you and I, under face-to-face -face teaching, are confronted with the divine viewpoint of things, and when we accept it and embrace it, then this is that then our thinking processes, our mind is renewed. You're here today, your mind is renewed, that you may discern what the will of God is in, a, in any set of circumstances you may find yourself in. And the will of God is that which is ultimately and intrinsically good. The Greek noun, uh, the Greek adjective agathos, that which is intrinsically good and acceptable. God accepts it. This is the will of God. When you do it, it's acceptable to God and perfect, can improve on it. <clears throat> you, can, you cannot improve on the will of God. And I am out of Kleenex. See, so I'm under testing. I'm all right. <laughs> I'm all right. There's just none up here. Somebody stole them. I thought I had some. Anyway, um, so the positive command to be transformed has to do with, and this is down to point 22, the positive command, be transformed, has to do with the inner person of the new man, where truth resides. <coughs> where truth resides. Uh, this is another way of stating what we state in many ways in di different places in the Bible regarding the intake of Bible doctrine. This provides us with new priorities, interests, and norms and standards. We're not here talking about legalism. That is a distortion of this on the part of, of a lot of Christians. They are legalistic. Uh, that's not what we're talking about either. <clears throat> so this is the product of the function of what we call GAP, the grace apparatus for perception. 
everything we need, a believer needs, in order to be able to properly take in Bible doctrine. <clears throat> Thank you. Appreciate it. Ask and you'll receive. All right. Uh, the uh, excuse me for excuse me. Got the wrong chapter here. <clears throat> so this is the product of gap, and. Uh, I'm going to do this. Colossians 3.10 one. And as we'll get into uh, a series of exhortations about Christian behavior, do's and don'ts. It's always good to hear this over and over. You probably already know this is true, but we need to hear this. Do not lie to one another. Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. When did that happen? When you made the salvation adjustment. The STA, for its very first time in your life, the sin nature, indwelling sin nature, was isolated. That moment in time when you exhaled faith in Christ. It laid, you, laid, you laid it aside. Now, obviously, very soon thereafter, you committed a sin, known or unknown, to you. You come to Bible class, you find out what, what these activities are, and here is a sin of the tongue, lying, a very common sin. People lie for a variety of reasons. One of them is they don't want the truth out about something. Uh, so they lie. Uh, and have put on the new self, the new man, who is being renewed, this, is, this renewal process is, in a nutshell, face-to-face -face teaching. You come here, you are brought face-to-face -face with the reality of God's plan, not that you can't be uh, involved with certain things on the outside, like reading your Bible, but there's no substitute for the renewal process and this environment that is so abused by so many. They don't go to church. They sit home and watch TV or have some online counselor or devotional teacher or all the, all the abuses that I've tried to bring to your attention over the years that you don't follow, uh, even if they were, you don't follow multiple uh, pastors or teachers. You don't do that. This, this is one that people have run up against, but go back and read John chapter 10. He makes it very clear that the believer identifies with this one person at a time and identifies with that person and makes that identification like a marriage, like a union of two people that make, it when, the, when things are right and people are doing things properly, they make an identification. They identify what God has already set up. So uh, I don't recruit people. I witness to people from time to time about doctrine. And uh, I, if I feel inclined, I, I tell them, well, well, that's interesting. Well, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm going to get real excited. I don't get excited. I just say, well, if you are, uh, well, show up. There is no obligation. You'll be put under no pressure whatsoever other than what you put yourself under. Show up. Check it out. I get very few takers. But, you know, because inevitably, well, what do you do for a living? Or blah, blah, blah. You know, so. And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. 
And uh, this renewal knows no racial barriers whatsoever. It's open to all. That's a great thing about biblical Christianity. It is not exclusive of certain groups or individuals because of, as the list in verse uh, 11 points out, a renewal in which there is no distinction, no favorites are played. God is not in to the favorites. Between Greek and Jew, those were two completely opposite cultures in the Roman Empire. He's talking about Orthodox or practicing Jews. And the Greek, the Greek, uh, uh, the Greco uh, outlook, worldview, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian. From the, from the Roman perspective, a lot of these people out there, they were barbarians. It was kind of a mocking term because they, didn't, they, they viewed that their language wasn't sophisticated. Their, their manner of speaking and their speech uh, was not sophisticated. And they, and, they, and they poked fun at them. And so they go, bar, 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 bar. The, 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 the sounds of, of these other peoples. So that's the barbarian. And that means, therefore, uncultivated, uncivilized. Okay, so let's say there are those like that. The plan of God's open to them, too. Equally. Scythian. That's a strange one. You read that one, you go, Who, what are, what's that? Well, they were a, a very warlike people up uh, in north, up kind of towards where all this activity is going on now. The Scythians. You can, you can look them up online and read what they were. They were, they were very, very warlike people. Scythians. Slave and free man. The Roman Empire, one out of four or whatever it was, was a slave owned by someone else, like you own a piece of property or a possession. That's my car. You own that. You own that person. You, you ordered and directed their life 24-7. That was a slave, and there were Christian slaves. But those who were, see, as a result of Roman conquest, they brought a bunch of people into the Roman, Roman Empire proper, and uh, they, were, they worked for the, for the slave owners. So as an institution, it existed. And uh, so slave and free man, that would be in, in, the, in the perfect sense, someone who is born, now again, the context. I was born into a civilization, into a nation, in which, on paper at least, I'm free. I have freedoms. Nobody can tell me, as long as I, I'm not hurting anybody else, I can live where I want to live. I can do what I want to do for a living. I am free. I have freedom of speech and thought. That is under attack today, big time. But that's, that's what I have by legal mandate in my constitution. I have freedom of assembly, freedom of association, or disassociation. I can get up in the morning and do what I want to do or not do. I am free. So in the Roman Empire, those who were free, they had certain rights that the others didn't have, obviously. But Christ is all and in all. So whatever your set of circumstances, uh, you are, the plan of God is open to you. So this transformation is the product of the function of gap. Perhaps you have noticed this. Perhaps others have noticed this in you. As a result of coming to Bible class, you've changed. You changed. You used to be a worrywart. You used to be this and that, flighty. 
the, uh, all the rest of it. You're not, you've changed. It's an, in, it's an internal transformation that may affect you and will affect you to certain degrees overtly, but basically it's internal. It's internal transformation is related to the intake of Bible doctrine, where the believer develops discernment with respect to the will of God. Hebrews 5, 14. Uh, the author here, the anonymous author of the book of Hebrews, and I have my favorite pick, and it's, but that's a, it, it's not dogmatic. Um, pretty sure it wasn't Paul. Uh, I don't get the Apollos connection. And some have said, though I haven't checked it out personally, there is a real affinity of vocabulary between this and the writings of Luke. And this would be unusual because Luke was born, bred, raised Gentile. Paul's personal physician and assistant, historian and physician, highly talented individual on his own right, but he was a, made a great contribution to, uh, and the only Gentile writer of the Bible, the only one, Luke, Acts, and possibly Hebrews. I don't know. We'll just leave it at that. It's not critical to the interpretation of this book because this book was written to Christian Jews living in the land of Israel before the, before the country was uprooted. Before 70 AD, they were getting close to it. And these Jewish Christians living in Israel, in the nation at that time, in that commonwealth, they uh, were flagging spiritually. They, were, they had been, been under the gun, so to speak, persecution by their fellow Jews. Somebody says, you haven't been persecuted, they've been persecuted by a Jew. If you're one of them, and you racially, and you become a, 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 an outspoken Christian. I'm not saying they all do, but definitely in the, in the uh, early going here, in the early going, of the church age, they really came, the Jews really came down on those who embraced Christ as Messiah and believed in him and were involved in local churches. They persecuted him, uh, denying him jobs, employment, not treating him equally, other things they were doing. And in the early stages of the persecution, they did beautifully. These Jewish, born-again Christians, they did wonderfully. It's brought out in the letter there. You endured these things, and you did it joyfully, knowing you have a great reward coming when people give you trouble because you're a Christian. You've got great reward uh, lined up for you when you are abused by negative volition, whatever that is. Well... We, got a, we get to this letter and they're, they, they, they've been on this, they've been on this, it's a combination of factors. There was a famine in the world. They were under economic hardship. Both this book and the book of James is addressed to the same group. Jewish local, Jewish believers living in the land of Israel before 70 AD, obviously. Because after 70 AD, as that, when that event approached, believers living in Israel, Jew, by, by definition Jews, they were, given, they were given a heads up on what to do to, to survive the Roman invasion and the destruction of that nation, which wasn't going to be pretty. The Romans didn't destroy things. If you revolted against the Romans, now this is brought out in the prophecy of Daniel. That the Romans, uh, if, you, if you cooperated with them, they treated you real well. If you didn't, things were going to go bad 
real bad when under the conquest. And the Jews had been revolting against Roman rule, causing trouble. And so finally, the Romans had had enough and under, under God's plan to uproot and disperse the Jews and shut down that nation, the Romans were coming. And the Christians living there in the land, they weren't going to make any distinctions. And, 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 and uh, whether, whether a person is fighting or just a civilian, you're going to be drug off into captivity, made a slave, and perhaps ripped apart from your family, uh, all kinds of stuff coming down. So these Christians were told by, by the Lord in his discourse, when you see these Roman legions forming up, get out, pack your bags, and find somewhere else to go. That's your, that's your way out. And these Christians were on the, on the cusp of that. They were on the cusp of it. In other words, God was going to change their niche dramatically and relocate them geographically within the Roman Empire if they would follow orders. And that is, it's time to pack your bags, get your possessions, whatever you need to do, and get out of here. See, believers are given insight with regard to future things. And so, <clears throat> these believers went into spiritual lethargy. Their enthusiasm for the plan and application level went down. This can happen to people. When it's up here real high in the thick of things, and then with, the, with things going on for years, time lapsed, they began to soul faint, they began to be lethargic in their applications of Bible doctrine. It can happen to people for a variety of reasons. They get distracted by the things of the world and they want this and that, the, the, the things that are enjoyable to the flesh. They want that and it, be, it begins to seep in and take over their thinking first and then their perhaps attendance in Bible class, their function under their spiritual gift, and what have you. This happens. This happens to believer and begins to erode and undermine the strong, positive volition and zeal that they once had. You gotta work on this at times. There is so much out there calling and begging for your attention. And so many distractions of all kinds and sorts. <clears throat> uh, he says here, uh, on the verse I was going to get to here, for uh, 12, for, through, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. That's how bad they got. We need to go back to the, we, you need somebody to start you up again and reteach you the basics. The ABCs of Christianity, as in school, in a topic, in a legitimate study, you start with basic stuff. If you're doing math, you start with basic math and work your way up. I mean, you gotta learn how to add and subtract, multiply and divide, and so forth, before you can go up the, uh, another level. This is the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have, you have come to need milk. What are you feeding your little ones, your littlest ones? You're feeding them milk. They don't have teeth. They need milk. Their body is able to digest this. You have need of milk. They're another way of expressing basic doctrine. You have need of milk. And you have come to eat milk and not solid food. Another way of expressing Bible doctrine. Real basic stuff. Basic, basic stuff. 
a lot of churches, they're not even getting milk. If they are, it's sour. It's, it's, it isn't clear basic doctrine. For everyone who partakes only of milk, basics, is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant, a spiritual infant, and stuck in, 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 in the status of infant. Oh, they're cute, they're wonderful, and they're good to have and everything, but we do want them to grow up. We want them to get up beyond that. We don't want them to stay in that infant state. where they can't talk, they can't do a lot of things that, that, a, that, a, that, a, that a mother, for instance, has to do for them. We want them to get on up, the, up there. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So your discernment factor Things that appear good in the world, a lot of times, they're really evil. So you, so you have this ability to discern good and evil. What's the point? This includes, as stated many times, the viewpoint will of God. What am I to think about fill in the blank? Of course, the geographical will of God, for most of us here, we've been here for years, and so that's, that's a settled issue. This is where we live. We might have moved around the city from one house to the next, but basically we're in, we're, we've stayed in the geographical will. Mine's changed a few times through, uh, since I became a Christian. St. Louis, Missouri, to Conway, Arkansas, to Houston, Texas, all those were, were, were fairly brief. And then here, Oklahoma City. And that's the geographical will of God. Where does God want me to live, be, exist in the, uh, in the geography? And the operational will of God. What does God want me to do? What, what, am, I, what, what am I supposed to do? Well, you do a lot of the same things the cosmos does. You go to work, make a living, tend to your the responsibilities. Uh, that's, that's what you are to do, but beyond that, there's applications. So face-to-face -face teaching renews or revitalizes the believer. As one listens to Bible doctrine after being out there, being exposed to the cosmos. I like to deal with the cosmos and my exposure to it with a long, as they say, with a long-handled spoon. I have to deal with it. I have to, not like some of you, because I don't have to go into a work environment where, I, where all these people are loaded up with human viewpoint and so forth. They may be, they may be good, good employees working and doing their job. And uh, that's fine. That's, you're interacting with them uh, to get something done. But when it comes to their viewpoint with regard to you name it, it's often off, off the rails in certain respects. Or just simply the fact that this is what they're all about. This is their life, making a living, raising their family, good things. But, but no, no future look. No future look, some of these people, not at all. They may have been gone to church, probably heard these things, but, uh, and so, uh, and, and then some, some personal interest, like this one guy that was telling me his life story, uh, and I didn't ask, uh, uh, and I'm out at the uh, Mercedes dealership, getting some service done on my car this week, last week. And uh, he goes on and on. He's kind of a, one of those guys, that each one has a certain customer they oversee. And he did a good job, you know. 
with, with, with the thing. I sat out there for a couple hours to get, uh, it was basically an inspection of tires, brakes, and batteries. And I needed a starter battery. And so anyway, he starts talking about it. I know his family and, uh, and his obsession with golf. If I had been smart in my life, when I was young, I would have listened and I could have been a pro golfer. And I blah, 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 blah. And we play golf and blah, on, on and on and on. That, that, so that, that illustrates a person having enthusiasm. I have no problems with someone liking to go play golf. That's fine, you know? Keep everything in perspective. But it was just like, that's it. That's it. So when you, when, you, when you do hear some of these people talk, there is, a, spiritually, it's a, de, it's a desert. Nothing. Nothing edifying at all. There, some, some things they may say, talk about might be interesting. But often these people are doing it because it's their way of boasting. They, they like to say, they like to name drop. They go, well, I was here. I did this. I did that. I don't have a problem with a person saying I went and saw something and it was beautiful or wonderful and all. But it's, it's, there's just this way the cosmos operates. This keeps the believer in the loop, so to speak. Point 28. And the upshot is to identify what the will of God is on a wide range of topics. And again, you, you can imagine from my perspective, how do I get all this over to people? There are so many topics and subjects there. I just have to keep plugging away. Plug away, plug away. Here a little, there a little. Keep doing it, keep doing it. And then it's, it's your responsibility to process it and to incorporate it into your frame of reference so that you have, what does God want me to think about this? and so forth. That's where it starts in the mental attitude. So the mind, or the thinking, the noose, is renewed in Bible class. And the result, over time, is that you may discern what the will of God is. That's what we're talking about here. So you can maybe cite chapter and verse or just simply say, the will of God is, in this regard, this. And it's the same for everybody. What God's directive will is. <clears throat> Again, consistent attendance is crucial to avoiding human viewpoint and bad decisions. With a sin nature, we can make bad decisions. But we need Bible doctrine to continue to assault that monster, to expose it and reveal it, and all the negatives associated with following the dictates of the indwelling STA, which is easy to do. So easy. God's will is the ultimate good, point 33. God's will is acceptable or pleasing. You do it, you're pleasing God. In the midst of, name in a number of things. <clears throat> Under your current allotment of sufferings. And some of you, they're not insignificant. Uh... Some verses. And those who are in the flesh. Well, we're all in the flesh, aren't we? This has got to be something technical. Those that are under the dominant, where flesh is a synonym for the STA. When you are in, under your STA, you are not, you cannot please God. When I'm out of fellowship, at that moment, in that time frame, until I snap back, I cannot please God. Period. I have to rebound, get myself back in fellowship, and then 
do what is appropriate to please him. Uh, Colossians 1.10 This is what Paul prayed for the Colossian saints. This is, this is a part of his prayer content on their behalf. The three, for this reason, since the day we heard of it, he got a fresh report with regard to the status quo of this church that he founded. We have not, <clears throat> see Paul's writing from prison. He's writing from Roman, from the Roman, he, he, he's, he's detained in Rome. He's public enemy number one. His name is, you know, because Paul's doctrine, what he's teaching, challenges much of the culture of the Roman Empire, specifically the religious culture and other things uh, as well uh, uh, that was a part of Roman society and Roman rule at the highest level, all the way up to the, uh, the household of Caesar. Paul is preaching, basically, that your Roman religion is worthless. This is the truth over here, centered in the person of Jesus Christ and the plan of God. You can think, you know how that goes over? So he was, so he was, he went through all these sufferings. But out of the, the efforts of his ministry, these churches were formed like in the city of Colossae. Uh, the day we heard of it, they got a favorable report. We have not ceased to pray, pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk. Walk does not refer to putting one foot in front of another. This is, this is uh, for, for going from point A to point B as a person walks. So a person goes from one thing to the next in their personal experience. That you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit, divine good production. What do we want from a fruit tree? Well, if it's a peach tree, we want peaches. All right? Bearing fruit, in every good work, and, in, and see, here's the cycle. Application, intake, application, intake, and in, increasing in the knowledge of God. A constant increase level. And the believer is like an empty vessel that you keep adding to it until you reach the fill level. Increasing, as long as you live as a Christian and you're under face-to-face -face teaching, you will increase in the knowledge of God. Things will click with you. It, on occasion, it may be a bombshell doctrine dropped on you. We don't get many of those, but we've got a few. A bombshell doctrine that you, that, that you increased exponentially in your understanding of uh, the topic, a big topic in the Bible, a very big topic, whether you're talking about the first, the first opening of the Bible or the closing of the Bible, the doctrine of biblical creation, creationism, that so many have wrong. We got it. We increased in our knowledge. It came together. Our thinking was challenged. We looked at it. We examined it, we prayed about it, and we went, oh, that's it. Maybe embarrassing to have to, you know, eat all that crow, made fun of the flat earthers of antiquity, those dummies, they didn't have telescopes. <laughs> you know, I think, I think you're, gonna, you're gonna be amazed at how smart they were in the human realm in certain respects without some of these technologies that we have. That doesn't necessarily make you smarter. 
I was reading an article in the uh, 365 Israel News. They have figured out, scientists, Roman concrete, cement. It is far superior to what we do. Their buildings have lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. There is a recipe, a formula. It's detailed. They, that's why their building stood tall. Ours typically can last maybe a century. But the Roman ones, they had something going for them. They developed this technique so they could even build and put concrete under water, salt water. And the, uh, uh, this was at Caesarea uh, Philippi uh, on the coast of Israel. They made that largest type deal for a kind of a port area with this, a break, if you will, for the ocean, from the ocean, a water break. They put that under the water. And it's still standing. But what would what they, what they know? Well, in this article, which I cannot relate to you, all the different elements that, are, that make up Roman concrete, cement. It's amazing. And there's a, 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 a couple things we, don't, we didn't even ever looked at. They did that. Anyway, that was a little bit off topic. The, uh, uh, the verses, uh, okay, I read, I read the Colossian one. Elsewhere, talking about the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1. Finally, then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received it from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. What do you do with someone that's doing real well, spiritually? Spur them on to excel. The next up, uh, that's uh, and verse two, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus, the directive will of God. Let's take our break.